Great to be here again. So we talked to, uh, about, Mark is also my brother. So we have a lot of interesting conversations at home <laughs> and at work. Puts a new spin on vacation time. We really enjoy our work and, and we're talking about what is so critical right now and Mark is literally one of the brilliant people in the world. And I said, maybe we should come up with five global challenges and Mark, you tell us what the solutions are. So we're starting out with the greatest threats, which number one would be pandemics. These are according to Mark. Two is economic manipulations. Three is global liquidity explosion. Four is the failure of self-government. And five is global warming. So I think we should talk let's with, so let's, let's start. <laughs> let's start with pandemics. <laughs> Ebola, we all know about Ebola. It's hard to have fun with Ebola, isn't it? It's kind of <laughs> a light thing to start with. Um, we thought that would be a good place to start. Everyone's very worried about it. Luckily now, the U.S. has no cases at the moment. We'll probably have more. Um, in looking at the problem of Ebola, I think we're really looking at the more generic problem of epidemics and pandemics. And uh, although the media may have overdone it in the United States, we've had a good taste of how terrifying it can be to have a pandemic. We didn't have one yet, but we, I think we have a taste of, of what it could be like and how scary it could be. And if you look at this thing, t take a step back a, a little bit and say, well, what did we get out of all of this? You know, was there a positive part of this story? I think there was, because the Ebola scare is not over yet, of course, uh, was a bit like a flashlight, I think. It, it was helpful to society as a warmer upper for what could go wrong. And there are really two basic parts of this story. One part is scientific. So, you know, what is the disease? How is it spread? How bad is it? What are all the parameters around it? Uh, learn it quickly, and then how do you deal with it? How do you, quickly can you get vaccines up? We obviously are trying to do that right now. Uh, all those things are very important scientifically. But even more important, and I think anybody in, in the business would tell you this, is the human side. So, so even as we learn, let's get the pharma companies rolling faster, let's be more lenient in our rules of what do you test, let's get that stuff into the, into the population that's dying so that we can see if we can save them, all these things that are really important scientifically. More important is have we learned the human part of this correctly, or did we at least just learn it so that the next time around, we're better off? And I think that's the part we should focus on, because we did learn some things. And if you go back in your mind, you th think about what happened. There were things that happened in Africa and things that happened in the United States. And in Africa, the biggest problem was that people who lived there didn't trust their government or, or the doctors that first showed up. They killed some of the doctors that showed up. And, and there's a huge problem in global medicine, which is based on rumors. We, we have a friend, Heidi Larson, who works in this, wrote a book about it. The worst problem isn't getting vaccines into the crazy places in the jungle where you gotta go. The worst problem is the rumors. If the rumors are that the Christians are trying to sterilize the Muslims or that the government is trying to kill the, you know, all these rumors get going in the population and they prevent the caregivers from giving care. And I'm hoping, I don't know if this is true, but I'm hoping that having seen this on a very drastic scale in Africa, the people of Africa and maybe of other emerging nations, which by the way is the most likely place for a pandemic to begin, for other reasons, will have a second thought next time when their governments say, here's this new disease called XYZ, it's very dangerous and you need to have a shot. I think we're in better, better condition now to have that conversation with people in emerging nations than we were before. That's part one. And right with that, of course, is the failure of, of the developed world to respond quickly. This is a numbers game, and it could have been stopped very quickly if it had been stopped in its tracks in that first village, which is exactly what happened in the Congo before. But this time, everybody for some reason kind of waited, and that hesitation was dramatically dangerous and still remains dramatically dangerous. So lesson to everybody, not just the WHO, which is underfunded, but to the US, US and France, and everybody who's involved in trying to help, we waited too long. You can't do anything dumber than wait too long when these things get started. If you catch them right away, nothing bad happens. But if you wait, very bad things can happen. So I think we learned that too. I think if we had XYZ right now, people would pile onto it very quickly. 
They wouldn't wait eight months, they'd get on it. And, and, and that would make all the difference. There's a little bit more that's kind of a uh, happy ending, I guess, on some sense, which is, forget Ebola for a minute. When you look at the US, well, let's, let's just take Ebola in the US. When it came to the Dallas area, we had a guy present himself who was from the infected area, who had a fever. He walks in and says, I'm from Sierra Leone, and they sent him home. And that was bad. It got worse. You know, so, so things were done very poorly in the beginning, including our experts, the CDC, telling a woman with a 100 degree temperature, go ahead, get on the airplane. That's nuts. So we've learned some things on this side of the, of the, of the water, too. So I think when you ask, did we learn enough? I don't think we did learn enough. But at least we got a start on it. Now ask yourself, what do we, we die from? We don't die from Ebola in America. But we sure die from MERS and a bunch of other things that are carried to us through our hospitals. Number one killer, if I'm not wrong about this, I think I'm right, way more than breast cancer or anything else, is hospital-acquired infections in the United States. You're at risk when you go to get help. You're going to get cured. That's because we're not doing a good enough job in hospitals in general of treating infections, of fighting the same exact problem. So Ebola or no Ebola, we weren't ready at all. And we're not ready today. We need to learn that lesson. And this might be the best thing that happens out of the whole Ebola story, is if people can do a judo thing on this and flip it and say, well, what about MERS? What about these other things that are already in our hospitals? How do we get rid of these things which are killing people by large numbers? That would be a huge benefit and, in a sense, a solution that came out of the Ebola scare. I think that the Ebola thing will get shut down. It seems like there are some districts still that are growing in numbers, but the growth rate has gone down, and that's good in Africa. So probably this will get under control. Great news. But if we learn how to deal with disease in general that's carried by bacteria and viruses, that's better. And that'll be a solution that'll come out in lots of different ways. And we will have not only learned how to respond to X, Y, Z when the next unknown thing shows up, but how to respond to the things that are already killing us in America today. So I think that's a solution all of its own.